Thank you. And uh, this slide just tells you how to get into contact with the tens of thousands of resources we have for you at uh, reasons.org. And uh, if you're like me, you think of the best question to ask when the event is all over. I do take questions on Facebook and Twitter, so you're welcome to uh, uh, place your questions there. We still have some books left over from uh, this past Sunday. So if you go to the back there uh, with this QR code, you can get as many books as they're there until they run out. This is my latest book, Design to the Core. It came out just uh, three weeks ago. But I'm going to be talking about the content of this book, uh, Navigating Genesis. And all the books that we publish at uh, Reasons to Believe, you can get free chapters. In my case, reasons.org slash Ross is your gateway uh, to get a free chapter of this book and several other books. Now, Many people lose their faith when they read the first page of the Bible. But for me, the first page was a huge factor in my coming to faith in Jesus Christ as my master and savior. And so I want to share with you how we can look at this first page and transform it from the greatest difficulty in bringing people of faith in Christ to being the best possible resource to bring people of faith in Christ. Many Christians I know avoid Genesis like the plague. I want to give you confidence that this is really the place to start. It really does belong on the first page of the Bible. And what's unique to Christianity amongst the different religions of the world is that it's a two-book religion. It has the book of Scripture and the book of nature. I mean, we see in both Psalm 19 and Romans 1 that everything, every human being has been exposed to the truth of God's existence, his attributes, even the outline of the plan of salvation through the book of nature, which is why every human being stands before God without excuse. Not everybody has the Bible, but everybody has the book of nature. And the mission of Reasons to Believe is to use the emerging discoveries in the book of nature to bring people to the book of scripture and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And in particular, the people group we target are those that we refer to as STEM, uh, people that are uh, either employed in a STEM career or they're supporting people that are employed in a STEM career or they admire people in a STEM career. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. And the last survey that was done of high school students throughout America, 52% were pursuing a career in STEM. So this is a mission field that's going to grow over time and is growing all over the world. And I want to just share with you how that works with the first page of the Bible. And what I've discovered is no matter where I speak in the world, they may not know of John 3.16, but everybody has heard of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I've debated the executive director of the Skeptic Society, Michael Shermer, four different times in university campuses. The topic is never Genesis, but he always looks at Genesis 1 as the Achilles heel of the Christians. So no matter what the date, debate topic, he zooms in right in Genesis. And he always opens his talk and says, Genesis gets it wrong from the very first sentence. It says that the earth and the universe were created at the same time and astrophysics tells us there's a huge passage of time between the beginning of the universe and the formation of the earth. And what he's not appreciating is that biblical Hebrew has a very small vocabulary, 3,000 words if you don't count the names of people and cities. Contrast that with English, which is over 4 million words. And so if you want to know why there's so many different English translations of the Bible, it's the challenge of translating a very tiny vocabulary language into a large vocabulary language. And if you read through the Old Testament, you'll never find the word universe. Biblical Hebrew does not have a word for the universe. Now, you do have it in the Greek New Testament, but it's not in the Old Testament. But instead, they got this phrase, the heavens and the earth, shamayan arrest with a definite article. Wherever you see that, and you'll see it 13 times in the Old Testament, if you look up all 13 passages, it's clear it's an idiom phrase, an idiomatic phrase, a mesmerism 
that's used to expand the vocabulary of Biblical Hebrew. Whenever you see this, it's referring to the totality of physical reality. So it's not making a distinction between the stars and galaxies and the planets. Basically, the heavens and the earth means all matter, all energy, all space and time. And this is one of many passages that speak in the Bible that speak about how the beginning of the universe is the beginning of space and time itself. Now, I became a Christian by looking at all the different world's holy books and, uh, you know, critiquing them and discovering that of all the world's holy books, only the Bible gets all the science, gets all the history correct. And I was reading uh, Genesis at the same time that physicists in Britain and South Africa were developing the first of the space-time theorems. Today, we have over 30 of those theorems. And it's such that now within the community of astrophysicists, there's a consensus that these theorems really do prove that there's a beginning of space and time. But notice, the Bible said it first. You won't find this in any other holy book. It's unique to the Bible that there's a space-time beginning and that God was active before the beginning of space and time. I want to share with you, though, a comment made by one of the authors of these space-time theorems, Alexander Vilenkin. He describes himself as an agnostic, but this is what he wrote in his book, Many Worlds in One. He says, quote, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And what is that problem? Proof of a space-time beginning implies there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that brought into existence our universe of matter, energy, space, and time. In other words, a miracle-working God must exist. Now, there are many new books being published by astronomers and physicists who are declared atheists. But in the last three years, what you'll find in common with all their books is that we cannot escape deism. The space-time theorems prove there must be an agent beyond space and time that created everything. Now, they do struggle with a personal God, but they accept that such a causal agent exists. However, if you ask them, do you believe in God, they'll say, no, I don't believe in God, but I do believe in an agent beyond space and time that created everything. That's pretty close to a dictionary definition. Now, it's my wife that said, whenever you speak to a general audience, you should never have more than three points. When I first met her, I was giving talks where I had 15 points, 16 points, 22 points. She says, no, you need to reduce it to three. Of course, what I do with my three is I have subtitles, okay? But these are the three things I'm going to review for you for the rest of this evening which I think are the three most critical factors about the first page of the Bible. Number one is the frame of reference or the point of view for these creation days. We're going to begin there, then we're going to talk about the meaning of the Hebrew word for day that's used in Genesis 1, but we'll spend most of our time looking at the description of the creation events, and in particular, the chronology, the history in which they're laid out and then how we can put this to an increasingly uh, definitive scientific test. And some of these scientific tests were done just a few years ago. Basically making the point, the more we learn about science, the stronger case we get for the inerrancy and inspiration of what we call the Bible. Okay, Genesis 1.1, the frame of reference or the point of view is the universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But as soon as you get to the second sentence, it changes the frame of reference. It says the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters of planet Earth. That's crucial. The point of view does not remain the universe. It gets changed from the universe to the surface of the earth. Now, I keep running into scientists who tell me, Genesis 1 teaches scientific nonsense. If you think that the frame of reference for the six creation days is God above the earth looking down on the earth, they are correct. Everything taught in the six days of creation is wrong. It's scientific nonsense. 
But if you put the frame of reference on the surface of the earth, everything is correct with respect to established science. So just remember that. When people say it teaches scientific nonsense, ask them, well, from what frame of reference are you interpreting the days of creation? Now, it's not just Genesis 1 that talks about creation history. What's unique to the Bible is instead of giving you one account of creation or two or three texts, it gives you over two dozen major texts, half a chapter or longer, on the subject of creation. And there's three that almost perfectly parallel what you see in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, that would be Job 37, 38, and 39, Psalm 104, and Proverbs 8. And so before you lock into an interpretation of the first page of the Bible, look at all the parallel accounts that deal with the subject of creation. And when you go to Job chapter 38, it gives us some additional clarification of what we see here in Genesis 1-2. Because step one, and by the way, I was taught the scientific method in my Canadian public school education in grade one. I was taught it again in grade two, grade three. We got it all 12 years. I didn't pick up a Bible until I was 17. But by then, I'd been saturated in the scientific method. My Canadian school teacher said, whether it's history, geography, science, literature, it doesn't matter. You do all of your analysis following the scientific method. So I came to the text following the scientific method Step one of the scientific method, do not interpret until you first establish the point of view or the frame of reference. And it was Galileo who said the biggest mistake you can make in Bible interpretation is to get the wrong point of view. So that's step one. Step two, do not interpret until you first establish the starting conditions or the initial conditions. And notice Genesis 1-2 does that. It says the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters, which means we're to interpret the six days from that point of view, but then it gives us four starting conditions. It's dark on the surface of the waters. The waters cover the whole surface of the earth, and the earth is empty of life and unfit for life. But now the Spirit of God begins to perform his miracles on the surface of the waters. You go to Job chapter 38, verse 9, it explains to us why it's dark on the surface of the waters. God speaks here and says, I made the clouds and blanketed the clouds of the seas so that the seas would be dark. It's basically telling us it's dark not because there is no light. When God created the universe in Genesis 1-1, that was matter, energy, space, and time. And so we have light pervading the universe. I can tell you that the light was there the moment the universe was a trainth of a trainth of a trainth of a second old. But it was dark on the surface of the waters. It was dark because the clouds would not let any visible light through. If you want an analogy, think of Venus. Venus is an atmosphere 90 times thicker than planet Earth. That atmosphere is so thick, the only visible light that gets through is at the extreme red end of the spectrum. And planet Earth began with an atmosphere three times thicker than what Venus has today. No visible light would have gotten through to the surface at all. So what's happening on creation day one, where it says, let there be light, God transforms the atmosphere so the light can now pass through, illuminate the surface, and that makes possible photosynthetic life. The first microbes on the surface of the Earth were photosynthetic, they began to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and begin to convert that into oxygen and a variety of uh, food uh, products. So if you remember nothing else from my message tonight, remember this. The frame of reference is the surface of the waters below the cloud layer, not above the cloud layer, underneath the cloud layer. Now, the bigger the planet, and the farther away it is from its star, the thicker the atmosphere. That's why we know Earth began with an atmosphere 200 times thicker than it has today. We also understand how Earth wound up with a thin atmosphere because our solar system began with five rocky planets. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, 
and a fifth planet, Thea. What happened to Thea? It collided with the proto-Earth, made the Earth bigger, but the collision caused Earth to lose 99.9% .9 of its water and 99.9% .9 of its atmosphere. It also led to the formation of the moon. And that explains why we have such an unusual system here. Because what's unique about the Earth-Moon system, small planet orbited by a single gigantic moon. We see, no, see nothing like that anywhere else in the universe. So yeah, if you walk away from tonight, remember the frame of reference as the surface of the Earth. But I think some of you here are intelligent enough that you can remember two things from a talk. And that is that there are multiple definitions for the Hebrew word yom that's translated as day. Now, I didn't know Hebrew when I picked up the Bible at age 17, but I just read through it and realized the word day in the original language, at a minimum, must have three distinct literal definitions. Why? Because three are used in the text. So when you look at creation day one, it's saying that... Um, is using the word day for the daylight hours. Creation day four uses the same word day to describe 24 hours, and Genesis 2-4 uses that same word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. If you pick up a Hebrew-English lexicon, you discover there's a fourth literal definition, part of the daylight hours. Without owning any Hebrew, you know right away it's got at least three distinct literal definitions. Something else that I realized in reading through the text is that each of the creation days is closed off with an evening-morning phrase. And it's a strange phrase. Evening was, morning was, day X. And you see that repeated for the first six days. And I wasn't sure what the original words for evening and morning meant, but I knew at a minimum it was saying each day has a definite start time and a definite end time. I was expecting to find an evening and a morning for the seventh day. But when you look at Genesis 2, there is no evening morning phrase for day seven. It's missing. And that's affirmed by what you see in Psalm 95 and in uh, Hebrews uh, 4. What you see in those two texts is that we are to live our lives in such a way that we will enter into God's seventh day. So it's referring to the seventh day as an ongoing event which means we're still in the seventh day, which explains why there's no evening morning phrase for day seven. Now, part of my story is that I was, I think I mentioned this in the second service. Uh, by the time I was seven years of age, I was reading four or five books on astronomy and physics every week. And uh, when I was 11, my parents thought, I think our son is being a bit obsessive. I didn't think I was, uh, but they were worried that I was being obsessive. So they said, we need to have Hugh read something beyond physics and astronomy. And they knew it had to be science. So they bought our family a big, thick book on evolutionary biology. I was the only one in the family that read it. I remember telling my parents, Mom, Dad, the numbers don't work. We have all these phyla, classes, and orders of life showing up before humans, and nothing happens after humans. This doesn't work. And they said, well, go talk to your science teachers. I talked to my science teachers, and they said, well, go talk to those science professors you know at the university. Nobody could give me an answer for the fossil record enigma until I picked up the Bible at age 17. For six days, God creates. On the seventh day, he stops creating. That explains the fossil record enigma. It also explains why so many astronomers believe in God and so few biologists believe in God. In astronomy, it takes time for light to reach our telescopes. So almost all the data we get through the telescopes comes from the six days of creation. But in biology, most biologists focus their research on the human era. And they say, we see no evidence for the supernatural intervention of the creator in our biology studies. Well, of course, they're looking on the wrong day. On day seven, God stops creating. You're not going to see creation miracles on the seventh day. Now, God is still active. On the seventh day, it's kind of like our Sabbath. You stop some of your activities to focus on more important activities. And so God stops his creation work, and what does he do? He begins his work of redemption. 
He focuses on his work of redemption. When his work of redemption is finished, as we see in Revelation 21, he will create again. So, principle of the Sabbath there. Take regular time out of your busy work to focus on the most important issues of life. So that answers the fossil record enigma of why we see new phyla and classes before humans and none afterwards. Now, I've actually written a whole book on these creation days. It's called A Matter of Days. Again, you can get a free chapter at reasons.org slash Ross. But what I do is I take you through all 28 of the major creation texts of the Bible and make the point, if you take the Bible literally and consistently, it's clear these days of creation have to be six consecutive long periods of time. And therefore, there's no contradiction with the scientific record that tells us the Earth is 4.5662 billion years old and the universe is 13.79 billion years old. However, the science is clear that humanity is recent, and the Bible is clear that humanity is recent. Genesis 2 tells us that God created Adam and Eve when four known rivers come together in a, in a location. Today, that location is 200 feet below sea level, but during the last ice age, it was above sea level. According to Genesis 2, God created Adam and Eve sometime during the last ice age. But hey, we're looking at thousands of years. We're not looking at millions of years. Okay, I'll spend the rest of the time going through the creation events. Genesis 1-3, let there be light. Notice it doesn't say that God created the light. It doesn't say he made the light. It says, let the light be. When did God create the light? Genesis 1-1. The light appears for the first time on the surface of the earth on creation day one. We go to Genesis or the creation day two. This is the most controversial part of the creation text. In fact, I'm involved in writing a book right now uh, where I'm engaging theologians who think that uh, Genesis uh, creation day two statement is simply a figure of speech because all it says is water above and water below. It's the most cryptic statement of all the six creation days. But there's a reason why it's so cryptic. Genesis is not the oldest book of the Bible. The oldest book of the Bible is the book of Job. Notice in the book of Job who's doing the animal sacrifices. It's the patriarchs, not the priests. And no national states exist yet. This is before we have nations. And what you notice is in Genesis uh, uh, 1, 6, and 7, let there be water above and water below. But if you go to the book of Job, Job 37 and 38, it talks in detail about God uh, performing his miracles to set up exactly the right water cycle we need for human beings and civilization to flourish. And I got six here, but it's actually, if you go through the book of Job, it mentions 16 different kinds of precipitation. But the six main ones are rain and mist and dew, and then you've got frozen precipitation, snow, frost, and hail. We need all these different forms of precipitation in order to have human civilization flourish all over the earth. So that's what's happening in creation day two. God sets up this water cycle, or water cycles from the atmosphere to the ocean and lakes and back up to the atmosphere again. Then we get to Genesis 1-9, let dry ground appear. Now, I was reading this decades ago. As I said, I was just 17 years of age, and uh, I was going through the Bible. It took me two years to become a Christian. But I remember when I was 19, not yet a believer, and uh, I had an opportunity to take the first ever course taught on plate tectonics. This is at the University of British Columbia. Two of the three physicists that launched that discipline said, let's have a course. And somehow I managed to get into the course. I was the only undergraduate uh, in the course. But I remember talking to the two professors there and saying, you know, this is what the textbooks say, but you're saying that these textbooks are wrong. Plate tectonics causes the continents to grow. And this is what I'm seeing you say in your course, that uh, we have continents covering maybe 5 to 10% of the land mass of the Earth at the beginning of the Earth, and that it gradually grows up to the 29%. And 
I said, how well established is a five to 10% number? And they said, well, it's not at all well established. And that straight line we're giving you, uh, that's just a first order guess. We don't have the details yet. I said, well, is it possible that the Earth actually begins with no continents at all? And they said, well, yeah, that's possible. We think it's around 5%, but it's possible it could be zero. I said, oh, that's interesting, because I was checking that with the Bible. Flash forward to the year 2000. Now we got details which affirm that indeed the Earth begins with no land masses at all. Then you get these tiny volcanic islands. But notice in this graph here where you get the most aggressive growth of the continental land masses. It's when the Earth is a little bit less than half of its present age. Where does Genesis 1 put it? At the beginning of creation day 3, a little bit less than halfway through uh, the descriptive account. However, there was a paper published in 2018 which made the point that the growth of the continents is strongly linked with oxygenation. And therefore, this is now the present picture of the growth of the continental land masses. Here's my point. The more we learn about the history of continental land mass growth, the tighter and tighter fit we get with what Genesis taught thousands of years ago. And if you want to read about this, I have a 1,000 page article in layman's language. Just look up my weekly blog. Every week I write an article called Today's New Reason to Believe. Say, so how do you have one every week? Well, literally every day, about a dozen or more scientific research papers are published that make a stronger case for the Christian faith. I just pick one and write about it. But if you go to the June 11, 2018 archived article, you can read all about this. Okay, now we move into the second half of creation day three. Let the land produce vegetation. And it uses this word desha. Let it produce vegetation. Basically, it's a word that would refer to any kind of photosynthetic life, whether it be microbes, whether it be trees, or anything in between. And if you read it in the original Hebrew, it says, let the land produce desha, then it gives you three examples. And the examples are trees and fruit and seeds. But the Hebrew words for trees, fruit, and seeds are extremely generic. So we shouldn't be thinking of apricot trees. And it's not a complete list. It just says, here are three examples of the desha. Now, again, I mentioned I've debated Michael Shermer several times on university campuses never on the subject of Genesis, but he always brings it up. One thing he always brought up was this. He says, when we look at the fossil record, we see that the animals show up in the oceans first, and then we get fossil evidence for plants and the continents. Genesis has it the opposite way. Your book got it wrong. Now, well, how I responded in the first of those debates is to say, well, Michael, animals have bones and shells. They're gonna be well-preserved over long periods of time. That's not true uh, for plants. They decay easily. It's gonna be extremely difficult to come up with fossil evidence, and particularly if they're old, we're not gonna come up with it. Well, in the latter debates, I was able to respond based on some scientific papers. In 2009, a paper was published where they said, we don't have fossil evidence for plants on the continents, but we have isotope evidence that establishes that vegetation was abundant on the continents for at least 200 million years before the first appearance of animals on the face of the earth. And then two years later, a paper is published where he said, we've actually found the fossils. Uh, they found fossil parts. The biggest part they found was one millimeter across. So they didn't have complete fossils. That's all you'd expect, uh, given how easily uh, plant tissue decays. But now they actually have the fossil parts establishing that the vegetation was abundant for at least 600 million years before the first appearance of the animals. Now we move into creation day four, and it says, let there be lights in the sky. And notice it says, let there be. The word create is not used here. And this is when God transforms our atmosphere from being so hazy that creatures on the surface of the earth can see the light but not the sun, moon, and stars. And what happened in 2018, a team of physicists said, let's actually do a lab experiment. So they got this gigantic flask, filled it with the known constituents of Earth's atmosphere, but then they buried the oxygen content. 
The reason they varied the oxygen content, we have an accurate history of the first four billion years of the oxygenation of Earth's atmosphere. And so we have it less than 1%. You get a little bump uh, when the uh, Earth is about 2.3 uh, billion years old, but then that, it drops back down to less than 1%. And then about 580 million years ago, it suddenly jumps up to 8%, and it jumps up very suddenly. Have you ever heard of the Great Unconformity? It's a massive geological event that caused the oxygen to spike from a tenth of a percent up to 8%. Well, they duplicated that in the flask. And what I want to show you is what they were able to discover in this flask experiment. So when you got less than 1%, if the flask is so hazy, uh, you can't even see through the flask to the other side, even though it's only a couple of feet across. But what I've done here is to simulate this experiment by, through a photograph of a famous mountain in Colorado. And I got a photograph of that mountain where I'm simply a third of a mile away uh, from the peak. So at less than 1%, the haze is so thick you can't see it. Then you jump the oxygen up to about 2%, and now you can barely see something there in the background. As you push it up to 3%, the mountain becomes a little bit clearer. As we go up another 4%, 5%, 6%, here we are at 8%. Notice what shows up in the upper right. You can now see the moon. The moon was not visible in the first, but now it's visible there. And again, you can read all about this in an article I put out June 18, 2018. Creation Day 5. Let the water swarm with living creatures. This is the first time animals show up on the face of the earth. The minimum oxygen that animals need for their survival is 8%. The moment it jumps from less than 1% to 8%, immediately animals swarm over the face of the earth. Animals as big as two meters across. There's no time delay. They show up suddenly, and all the different phyla of the Avalon animals show up at the same time. There's no progression. It's instantaneous and simultaneous. And then we move on to the Cambrian explosion. Uh, that was 538 million years ago. This is when the oxygen suddenly jumped from 8% to 10%. When it's at 10%, you can now have animals with a circulatory system, a digestive tract, a brain, and a heart, and you can have eyes and ears. And the moment it hits 10%, uh, a phylum, by the way, refers to a broad category of an animal plant. Uh, there are 30 phyla on the face of the earth today. The very latest research that just got published demonstrates that all the phyla we have on earth today were also present at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion, and they all show up simultaneously. And by the way, at the Cambrian explosion, there's actually more than that. About 50 phyla all show up suddenly. The moment it is 10%, all 50 phyla show up suddenly and simultaneously. It basically shows God has taken advantage of the conditions with immediate creation, something you see in Psalm 104. God always is packing the earth with as much life as possible and as diverse as possible. Now, I want to give you a couple of quotes from atheists and uh, paleontologists. A paleontologist is somebody who looks at fossils. This is from Gregory Ray, who wrote a review of the Cameron explosion in the American Zoologist. He says, the Cameron explosion of body plants, referring to the phyla, is perhaps the single most striking feature of the metazoan fossil record. Metazoan means big animal. The rapidity with which phyla and classes appeared during the early Paleozoic, coupled with much lower rates of appearance for higher taxes since, poses an outstanding problem for macro evolution. And later, Kevin Peterson, uh, also uh, an atheist, uh, wrote this, elucidating the materialistic basis that is a non-supernatural basis for the Cameron explosion has become more elusive, not less the more we know about the event itself. And I'm actually going to be giving a lecture uh, to the Anchor House students, making the point uh, from the very latest research papers published by paleontologists that if it's naturalistic, we would expect the proliferation of species 
to eventually produce new genera. And if we wait long enough, the proliferation of genera uh, will make new families. Then families will produce new orders. Then orders will produce new classes. And last of all, we get the phyla. But as James Valentine has says, when we look at the fossil record, we see the opposite of what naturalistic models would predict. The phyla show up first, and the species show up last. It's the exact opposite of what you'd expect. And you can read a lot more about this in my book, uh, Improbable Planet. But here's the bottom line. When we recognize that the word yom, referring to the creation days, is an epoch of time, uh, not just 24 hours or the daylight hours, and the reference frame is Earth's surface below the clouds, not above the clouds, the scientific accuracy we get for the creation events is 10 for 10. It describes all 10 events in correct scientific uh, terms, and it puts them all in the correct chronological order. Seeing these results proved to be the major factor in my realizing the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God. It got all the science right. More than that, it predicted hundreds of times future scientific discoveries. The only explanation for why the Bible has such consistent and powerful predictive power is that it must be inspired by the one that actually did all the deeds. Now, as I mentioned, I checked out all the other religions uh, before I went at the Bible. The second best I found outside of the Bible is the creation account of the Enuma Elisha, the Babylonians. It gets two right and 12 wrong. The Bible gets a perfect score on the creation events, and it gets a perfect score on the timing and the description of the initial conditions. And that was a major factor in my signing my name in the back of a Gideon Bible, giving my life to Jesus Christ. And again, you can read more in Navigating Genesis, uh, but here's the conclusion. The more we learn about science, the more reasons we gain to believe that the Bible is the inspired in error word of God, cover to cover on all subjects, not just faith and practice, but science, history, and geography. I'll take what time remains to answer any question or attempt to answer any question you might have, and it doesn't have to be a question on the talk I gave tonight. Uh, I'll take anything. Yes? Is there any scientific proof for uh, Any scientific proof for? Noah's flood. Oh, Noah's flood. Okay. You're going to get a whole talk at Anchor's House on Noah's Flood. In fact, I think it's the first talk I'm giving tomorrow morning. It's going to be a Noah's Flood. You're going to get the whole story there. However, uh, what's caused the scientific controversy is a lot of scientists think the Bible teaches that the flood covered the entire globe, whereas what you see in 2 Peter 2.5 is it's the world of ungodly people that was flooded, or 2 Peter 3.6. Uh, it says the world that existed at that time was flooded. So the very fact that Peter twice qualified the, Hebrew, the Greek word cosmos with an adjective tells us he's not referring to the whole of the surface of the earth, rather that part of the earth where ungodly people lived. And there were no ungodly people living in Antarctica or in Greenland, so no need for God to flood Antarctica or Greenland. And uh, there's no need for Noah to take on board penguins on board the ark. Uh, and it's a principle you see in the book of Leviticus, is that animals can be damaged by human sin. But the only animals that can be damaged by human sin are the nephesh animals, the soulish animals, birds and mammals. These are animals that God designed to relate to human beings and to serve and please us. And dogs, for example, do anything to please their owners. But if the owner is vicious, guess what? You're going to have a vicious dog because the dog figures out, hey, this is what makes my owner happy, so that's what I'm going to do. Which is why you see in the book of Leviticus, if a cow has a habit of goring other animals and people, the owner is to be rebuked. And if the cow continues in that behavior, the cow is to be killed and the owner is to be killed along with the cow. Basically making the point, it's the human that was responsible for that cow's malicious behavior. The cow is not a sinner. The cow is simply trying to please its owner. Same thing with a vicious dog. It's just trying to please its owner. And so 
The animals that were destroyed by the flood were the animals that were associated with the wicked people. There's eight different words used in uh, Genesis 7 and 8 for the animals. The word basar that's used basically says nephesh animal that's related to human beings. And since penguins were not related to humans at all, had no contact with humans, they wouldn't be damaged by human sin, there's no need for God to destroy them. And there's no need for Noah to take a pair of emperor penguins on board the ark. But hey, you're going to get 45 minutes on this tomorrow morning. Anyone else? Yes. I, repeat that, please. Are you asking me, can we actually determine the duration of these six creation days? Okay. All we get from the Bible is that these days are longer than 24 hours. It doesn't tell us how much longer they are. It does say, for example, the Hebrew word yom cannot be used for infinite time. So these days have to be finite time. Now, where you get some support for this are the Old Testament texts where King David, for example, refers to the ancient mountains and the age-old hills. And there's a reference uh, in Samuel to the ancientness of the Kidron River. And these, if you go to Israel, you can see uh, the very extensive erosion uh, generated by the flow of the Kidron River. And uh, you know, David was writing about these ancient hills and mountains when he was in the Judean wilderness. Those mountains are running from 1,000 to 2,000 feet high. Uh, but at the base of those mountains, you'll see a huge pile of rubble, a lot of gravel. And uh, if you go there, I've been there, uh, you get about a rock falling off those mountains about once every week. But you look at the pile underneath and say a lot of weeks must have gone by. These are ancient hills. So that gives you a rough idea, but only a rough idea. And you say, is the science any better? Well, everybody thinks that science has actually got a really accurate time for the beginning of day one, the end of day one, beginning of day two. Actually, the error bars are quite large. Uh, we do know that the days get shorter as you go from one to six. The sixth day is the shortest of the six days. Day one is the longest. Uh, but yeah, we don't have precision dates. Well, the problem with having the point of view above the clouds is what it does to creation days one and four. Uh, because now you've got the sun not being created until the fourth day. But now you've got to figure out how do you keep plants warm with no sun? And uh, how do you keep the solar system intact without the gravity of the sun? And so those become big issues, which is why scientists say, hey, this is all scientific nonsense. There's no way you get the sun being created after the earth uh, or the stars coming after the earth. We have overwhelming evidence that there are old stars out there and uh, we can't make the dynamics work. So, and the Bible tells us the laws of physics don't change. If the laws of physics haven't changed, you've got a problem if you don't have a sun until the fourth day. Yes. Well, what's interesting, if you look at church history in detail, the church is always divided over the non-essentials of the faith. I mean, you see it in the book of Acts, chapter 15. The church was deeply divided over circumcision. Uh, and there's a different issue with every generation. And, uh, but if you look at the history in detail, each of these church-splitting controversies was fundamentally based, how can we keep unwashed people groups from attending church. And so in the first century, you had all these Jewish believers 
who are very uncomfortable with the Gentiles. What can we do to ensure that these Gentiles don't come to our fellowship? Well, we're going to ask all the men to get circumcised. Okay, that's a very effective way to keep the Greek men from attending church. And I would argue that this young earth, old earth thing is the same. Uh, I've been in a lot of churches, and they're quite uncomfortable uh, recruiting research scientists to join in their fellowship. You know, I've grown up with these research scientists. They will argue at the drop of a hat. Uh, matter of fact, uh, the church where I pastor, I'm on pastoral staff of a church. Rick was with me on that church. But it's a church that's between Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we're just a couple of miles from the headquarters of the Skeptic Society. So we get an interesting mix of people uh, that come into the church. And I remember I invited six bachelor physicists from Caltech, all of them unbelievers, to come to church one Sunday. So they're sitting there in the pews for the first service. And the pastor that day, he was five minutes into the sermon, and all five of them stood up and wanted to challenge him. And, you know, that's, that's what you do when you're at Caltech. You always challenge everything you hear and say. So, uh, unfortunately, the pastor stopped his sermon, answered their questions, and told them, look, if you want to go to a class where you can do debates, this guy Hugh Ross has a class right afterwards. And they said, well, he's the guy that invited us. So they came to my class, and we were doing a study in the book of Titus. And I remember one of these six uh, young uh, physicists got all excited about the passage we're in and says, we can do perturbative analysis on this text. So he ran to the blackboard and filled the blackboard with all these perturbative analysis equations. And I turned to him and said, you actually think everybody here uh, is fluent in perturbative mathematical analysis? Well, he says, yeah, of course, everybody is. We all know this. And so I said, okay, let's do a survey. How many in the class understand all the equations you put up on the blackboard? The only one that put up their hand was me, okay? The rest of them said, we haven't got a clue. He did not know. Everybody thought he was being uh, very offensive and expressing a lot of pride and arrogance. That was not what he was doing at all. He just simply didn't know. And then there was this lady at the back who said, I think I'm in the wrong Sunday school class. <laughs> okay. But it got worse. As we went on into the class, uh, two of these uh, physicists jumped up and said, hey, why don't you interpret the text in this perspective? I'll interpret it this way. And they began to have a vigorous debate. And uh, I had to stop them and said, are you aware that everybody in the class thinks you hate one another? They said, oh, no, we're best friends. We do this all the time with one another. The class was stunned. Is that how you physicists uh, treat one another? Yeah, we do this all the time. Uh, this, this is how we express our love and friendship for one another. <laughs> so there's a culture barrier. Just like there was a culture barrier between the Jews in the first century and the Greek converts, there's a culture barrier today. And don't be surprised if it generates a church-splitting doctrine that's got nothing to do with salvation. Now, I firmly believe this young earth, old earth uh, issue in the church will get resolved. If you read church history, they always get resolved. And when they get resolved, we wind up with a brand new church-splitting controversy that's got <laughs> nothing to do with salvation. And the point here is, if it's in the creeds, by all means, uphold it, and if necessary, fight for it. But if it's not in the creeds, let it go. Uh, there's no need to be abusive towards one another or to disfellowship one another if it has got nothing to do with salvation theology. And that's one thing that you see in all the creeds. Even the Westminster Confession, the longest of the creeds, it sticks to those doctrines that are crucial to understand how we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's nothing in the Westminster Confession on the age of the earth. There's nothing in it on circumcision. It just focuses on the essentials. So don't fight over anything that's not in the creeds of the church. And by the way, it's guaranteed a new church-splitting controversy will come. And I'll just say this too. The reason why God allows this is to see if we can practice 2 Corinthians 5. God says that we who are followers of Jesus Christ are ambassadors to bring unbelievers into peace with their creator, into relationship with him. But these non-Christians watch how we treat one another. They'll know you're my disciples, 
by your love for one another. If we're vicious towards one another, they're going to say, I want nothing to do with the Christians or with a Christian faith. So how we treat with one another is important, and it's especially important how we treat one another when we have significant disagreements, which is why I was happy to participate in a Two Views book uh, with Francis Collins and BioLogos. We have radically different views on the Bible. We have radically different views in the science. But in talking to Francis, he says, I want to partner with you to put out a book where we have sharp disagreements, but we treat one another with charity and love. And you can get the book. You can see that that tone is definitely in there. And basically wanted to set an example for the church. This is how we need to treat one another uh, when we have significant uh, differences in our beliefs. Okay, that was a little bit long. I'll try to be briefer on the next one. Yeah. Okay, well, right now, the Earth's tilt of rotation axis varies between 24.5 and 22.1. Uh, close enough. And yeah, when it's tilting towards 22.1, the planet gets colder. When it goes to 24.5, it gets warmer. So what's happening right now, it's getting colder. It's pushing it towards uh, getting colder. Has it always been just that two degree difference? Uh, no, if you go back, early into the history of the Earth-Moon system. The Moon was much closer to the Earth than it is today, and therefore the tilt variation was greater. Uh, but you want it to be at about the two and a half degree or less level if you want global human civilization. If it's going back and forth by five degrees, that eliminates the possibility of global uh, civilization. And incidentally, it takes the moon's gravity exerted on the Earth to stabilize it to that little variation. Mars has two small moons, uh, but those small moons are not able to stabilize uh, the tilt of the rotation axis. On Mars, its rotation axis flips back and forth by 60 degrees, which explains why its polar cap is small. Now, it does have a polar ice cap. Why? Because it gets bombarded by comets. Comets are 85% frozen water. And when they land on the poles of Mars, they stay frozen. But when the rotation axis tilts over, uh, that polar cap now gets exposed to an equatorial range, and it evaporates to outer space. But a new pole will form uh, with the additional comets. So that explains why Mars, in spite of getting such a heavy load of cometary delivery has very tiny polar caps. Uh, yes? Um, well, just two things. First off, um, I've watched quite a few of your uh, YouTube videos, and the, the, as you were just stating, the poise that you carry yourself compared to what some of the people, like, what, not to generalize, but a lot of the atheists, um, you're so much kinder than they are in your demeanor and everything, and I just want to applaud about that. Um, two, um, can you go into the Nephilim? The Nephilim? Okay. I do cover that in a chapter and appendix of Navigating Genesis. The question is, what do I think about the Nephilim or the Nephilim? And you see it in Genesis chapter 6, uh, where it says, uh, the sons of God came and had sexual intercourse with the daughters of men and gave rise to the Nephilim. And they were on the earth before the flood, but it says after the flood, the sons of God came back and so we have a new generation of Nephilim. And uh, some equivalent phrases you'll see in the Old Testament. Raphaim, they're the Nephilim. Uh, the giants of old, they're the Nephilim. Uh, so Goliath was part of the Nephilim. Og, uh, the, the king of Bashan, uh, was part of the Nephilim. Uh, the smallest Nephilim we see in Scripture is Goliath. Uh, he has a minimum height of nine feet, nine inches. And it says he carried a minimum of 250 pounds of weapons and armor in the battle against David. Uh, and so you'll see a section in Navigating Genesis where I say there must be something supernatural about these Nephilim because you're violating the physics of basketball. Okay, basketball is a sport where the probability of you sinking a basket goes up with a square of your height. 
which means a seven-footer is going to get twice as many baskets as a five-footer. So it explains why you have so many tall uh, individuals in male and female basketball. You always recruit the tallest ones, uh, with exceptions. Because once, for men, once you get past six feet, six inches, your increasing height means you have a loss of mobility. And it makes good sense. You're dealing with the law of gravity. The taller you are, the more damage you're going to do to your body when you trip and fall. And so these really tall uh, NBA players, they're injured a lot. And moreover, they're not as mobile as the uh, players uh, that have less height. And so you're probably aware of the Los Angeles Lakers and the conflict between Kobe Bryant and uh, between Shaquille O'Neal. You know what was generating the conflict? Kobe Bryant be whizzing down to the court and he had to wait uh, for Shaquille O'Neal to lumber down the court so he could pass the ball to him. So he says, hey, forget this. I'm just going to get the basket myself. And Shaquille got upset saying, look, with my height, I got a higher probability of getting to that basket. And he would say, yeah, but you didn't get down here fast enough. So that, that's the problem there. Uh, but what you see is once you get above eight feet, the loss of mobility becomes almost total. Now, I knew uh, a Hollywood actor who was seven foot nine. Uh, any of you have ever watched um, uh, 007? Uh, it showed this guy Jaws. Well, he was that actor. And uh, he's a Christian. Uh, but... He was mobile for that uh, James Bond movie, but shortly thereafter, he was in a wheelchair. And he's in a wheelchair to this day, significant loss of mobility, and he knows he's not going to live a long life uh, because of his great height. And, uh, but bottom line is, once you hit, say, about 8 foot 10, the loss of mobility becomes total. And yet, here we have Goliath, at least 9 foot 9, and he's able to take 250 pounds into battle and it tells us he was a great warrior. And then you got Og, the king of Bashan. His bed was at least 13 feet long, made out of iron. So uh, he was probably quite a bit bigger uh, than Goliath. Uh, so the sons of God, what I do in the book is I say, let's look up this phrase, sons of God, everywhere in the entire Bible. The only place you see it used for humans is once you get past the day of Pentecost. So before the day of Pentecost, Jesus referred to his followers as sons of men. After the day of Pentecost, he never referred to them as sons of men. He only referred to them as sons of God. Likewise, before the day of Pentecost, the title of Jesus was son of man. After the day of Pentecost, he never took that title. He was son of God. So this is why most Bible scholars believe the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 are fallen angels. And also you see in Jude 6, it talks about a subcategory of fallen angels who left their estate. That's what it says in the English. The Greek is basically as, uh, cognizant with um, bestiality. It's accusing the angels of committing bestiality. And for that reason, they're put into the abyss. And the abyss apparently is a horrible place. The demons hate it. And it comes up in the Gospels when Jesus casts out demons. The demons say, don't send us to the abyss. And Jesus says, I won't. You haven't committed the offense that deserves you going straight to the abyss. But evidently, some angels did. But yeah, what I do in navigating Genesis, I give you the three predominant theories and the strengths and weaknesses theologically of the different theories. You can get them as e-books. Yeah, all of our books are available as e-books. A few of them are even available as audio books. Yeah, you're next. You mentioned on Sunday about the hate spot that's occurring right now. Yes. Humanity, and you, you alluded to the fact that it's also Can you talk more about the time period of Okay. It's either tomorrow or Thursday. I'm going to be giving a talk on uh, weathering climate change. And this is where I'm going to talk in detail about that window. And if we're talking global high-tech civilization, the window is actually shorter than 2,000 years. There's a limit to how long we can sustain that. And now what I'm going to be sharing is global civilization is only possible if you live during an ice age cycle. But if you're in an ice age cycle, that means you have an interglacial followed by a glacial. 
we're heading towards a glacial. And if we respond appropriately to global warming, we'll be able to put off the onset of the next ice age uh, by maybe as much as 1,500 years. And if your theology is pre-millennial, you're going to need an extra 1,000 years, okay? So if you're not pre-millennial, yeah, then you can have a shorter time frame. So, uh, and what I'm going to show you is how we can uh, put off the onset of the next ice age while we boost the world economy and make the world a better place uh, for the ecosystems and a better place for the poor. What I think is driving the climate change debate are people claiming we have to make a choice. In order to do what's right for the rest of life on planet Earth, we humans have to sacrifice our economy. The biblical principle is God put us humans in charge of the resources of the Earth were to manage it for our benefit and the benefit of all their life, implying we will not have to choose. There will be win-win solutions. So I'm going to share with you what I think are some uh, very attractive win-win solutions that we can implement right away. We don't need the governor of Hawaii to set laws for us. I hear you've got some rather draconian things going on here in the state, even more so than what we have in our state of California. None of this is necessary. We just need to give people the appropriate economic incentives. We don't have to pass laws. We don't need penalties. We don't need taxes. Yes? Um, this world is fallen. Yes. Does it extend to the entire universe? And if it's just the Earth, how far out? Well, God began his works of redemption before he created anything which means he knew sin and evil would come. But he purposely created the universe with certain laws of physics and created the universe with a certain number of stars and galaxies so that when sin and evil enter in, he can efficiently and rapidly eradicate all evil and suffering. And I've described this in a book called Why the Universe is the Way It Is, Why We Have the Laws of Physics We Do why the universe is the age that it is, uh, why it has the history it does, why it has two trillion galaxies. You need all those two trillion to get one planet Earth in which humans uh, can exist. But everything is designed with redemption in mind. Uh, so, and as I mentioned earlier, unique to Christianity, it's a two-creation model. God creates the universe as a tool to eradicate evil and suffering while he enhances the free will capability of his followers to receive and express love. And once that's been achieved, God will speak the universe out of existence, just like he spoke it into existence. He'll speak it out of existence and replace it with a new creation. In the new creation, there's no sin, there's no evil, but we have an even stronger free will, which enables us to express and receive love to a degree that's exponentially greater than anything that's possible in this creation. So yeah, a better life is coming. Yes. And who are you referring to? Oh, Ken Ham, yes. I've had many debates with Ken Ham. Yes. So, so one of the challenges that, that seems to come up through your debates is the, we weren't there. And we don't get, and sometimes when we hear scientists speak, it's said with such authority, and yet we don't get a chance to go back. And one of the things that Ham really brought from, to my mind was what is real proof? Is it scientific proof? Why is it scientific? Is, is it, we can't count the grains in the trees. We don't know. Yeah, that's what Ken Ham keeps saying, is that uh, what we do with reasons to believe is we put human science above the Word of God. I keep refuting that, but he just keeps repeating that same line. 
You can watch a debate I had with him on TVN. It wasn't supposed to be a debate. Basically, they had six of us there, and Matt Crouch said, each of you got five minutes to present the best scientific evidence for the Christian faith. I went first, but Ken Ham immediately turned it into a debate over the authority of God's word. And notice he kept interrupting me. And there's a good reason why he did. He knew exactly what I was going to say. Namely, that all six of us accept the authority of God's word. We all believe that the Bible is the ultimate authority. It's above all other authority. There's no disagreement there. There's no need for this debate. But he tried to imply uh, that Sean McDowell and I, for example, uh, believe that man's science is superior to God's word. Uh, completely false. Right. Okay, what I can share with you is this. Every young earth creationist model fundamentally depends on the laws of physics being changed by at least a factor of a million times at the fall and the flood. You can see this in their own writings, where they say if there's no change in the laws of physics, then the earth and the universe must be billions of years old. It's in the rate study. Both volumes of the rate study say that repeatedly. Here's the problem. Not only does astrophysics say there's been no change in the laws of physics, the Bible says there's been no change in the laws of physics. Seven times the Bible tells us the laws of physics are fixed. Where you see that most explicitly is in Jeremiah 33, where God is talking to the Jews and say, you change your mind all the time, but I'm immutable. I'm a God that never changes. As proof, look to the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And Romans 8.23 says that those laws remain intact until the full number of humans that God will redeem have been redeemed. Well, we're not there yet. And so uh, no change in the laws of physics, but if there's no change in the laws of physics, it's impossible to interpret the science from a young earth perspective. I also argue it's impossible to read the Bible literally and consistently from a young earth perspective. If you're interested, there's a Four Views book called Creation, Evolution, and Intelligent Design. Four authors. I'm one of the authors. Ken Ham is one of the authors. Deborah Harzma of uh, Biologos, who teaches theistic evolution, she's one of the authors. And then we've got Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute. Very interesting book. Uh, but what I notice is all four authors said, we believe in biblical inerrancy. And I knew otherwise, so I basically said in my response, do you believe in biblical inerrancy is defined by the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy? All three of them said no. I'm the only one of the four authors who's willing to uphold biblical inerrancy as defined by the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy. And the whole point is, you can't defend biblical inerrancy from a young earth creationist perspective. And I believe that's a crucial doctrine of the Christian faith. It was Jesus who said, the word of God cannot be broken. And so the fact that Jesus endorses biblical inerrancy, we got Paul endorsing biblical inerrancy, it's like, that's something we have to uphold. And so what was done by the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy, 300 theologians from all over the world spent a decade carefully defining what biblical inerrancy is and what it is not, at least in my opinion, it ranks at the level of the creeds. This should be a 20th century creedal statement, given the care and uh, attention they went in going through the entire Bible and defining it. Now, as with respect to Ken Ham's repeated statement, you weren't there, he's dead wrong on that. Astronomy has no access to present science but it has direct access to past science because it takes time for the velocity of light to travel to our telescopes. We don't see the sun as it is now. We see it as it was eight and a quarter minutes ago. And uh, we don't see Andromeda as it is now, or pardon me, the Orion Nebula. It's 1,500 light years away. We see it as it was 1,500 years ago. And so we have direct access to the past. It's not inferred. Ken Ham keeps saying, we're inferring the past. No, we're directly observing the past, which is why we get our most rigorous and compelling scientific evidence scientifically 
for the God of the Bible from astronomy because there's no assumptions. We're directly observing past events. As I shared with the students earlier, we can see so far away with our most powerful telescopes, we can actually directly image the condition of the universe when it was a hundred billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. That's how close we get to the cosmic creation event. We astronomers are actually directly observing God creating the universe. We can watch him bring the universe into existence, which explains why so many astronomers are followers of Jesus Christ. Okay. All right, you gotta tell me when I need to end here. I, I don't know how, what, what you're, I don't know the culture here in Hawaii like all of you, but go ahead. If there's surf there, okay. Well, it's interesting. Uh, when I was talking to R.C. Sproul when he was alive, he says, Hugh, you've got to tell me there's golf courses in the new creation. I said, well, the new Jerusalem itself has a living space uh, that's hundreds of times greater than what's available on the surface of the earth. After all, you could divide it up into, because there's no gravity there, so if you want, you could break up the new Jerusalem into uh, 1,000 different stories. But each story, you could have mountains that are 10,000 feet high, so if you want to have uh, a ski slope in your backyard, you could. You could have two championship golf courses. And you figure out, okay, what's the maximum number of people are gonna be living there? Uh, well, each, each person can have a mansion that has a property of several square miles, uh, and then you could have a ski slope in your backyard two championship golf courses. You can have a surfing beach there. Uh, you know, a game that we played with our sons when they were young was, it's better than that. 1 Corinthians 2.9, no one can think or imagine how great and wonderful the new creation will be. I will tell you, it's different dimensions. It's different laws of physics. So the waves there are not gonna be the same as the waves here. They're gonna be way better, okay? and uh, you're not gonna drown. Uh, so uh, maybe there's no uh, sharks out there. I don't know what it's gonna be like, but it's gonna be better. And yeah, I remember when we first played this game when our younger son was three years of old, age, he said, I think the new creation is a place where we all have mansions uh, with dozens and dozens of different rooms where there's a water slide out of every window into a pool uh, with a perfect temperature uh, that we can all enjoy. And I says, David, it's better than that. And he says, wow, better than that. And so every dinner we would play that game. We always ended the dinner, it's better than that, whatever you can come up with. Now, that's actually an exhortation. Uh, it was Paul who said, no one can think or imagine how great and wonderful it is. The same apostle Paul said, every day of your life, do your best to imagine how great and wonderful it be and be assured it's better than that. So the game we were playing with our sons, I think the Apostle Paul is telling us we need to play that game every day. And that really encourages us to live our lives here on earth. As Paul says, this life here on earth is a race. Run it for all your worth uh, so that you can get the crowns that God wants to place upon you when you finish your race. Because what's ahead is way better than anything that exists here. So think of your very best surfing experience. Multiply that by a factor of a quadrillion, and it's better than that. Yes. 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 Okay, well, you'll see in the New Testament two genealogies that uh, trace uh, Jesus, uh, you know, back uh, to King David uh, and all the way back to Adam, for that matter. But if you look at those genealogies and compare them with the genealogies and Chronicles, you notice a lot of names are missing. And if you could look at Genesis chapter 5, 10 names. But if you look at uh, Luke 3, there's 11 names. And so... Every genealogy has got missing names. And what I was sharing with some students today is always pay attention to what names are in there and what names are missing. It's making a theological point. So for example, there's one genealogy 
uh, where it makes a special point of mentioning women. Most of the genealogies only mention men, but there's a couple where they make a special point of measure, mentioning the women and mentioning women uh, that had significant moral failures. Basically making the point, the salvation is being offered to every humanity. Regardless of the sin that you've committed, salvation is available to you. Regardless of your sex, regardless of your nationality or ethnic group, regardless of the handicaps you might have or the gifts that you might have, it's for everyone. And uh, there's a scholar in our scholar community and she makes a point of giving uh, lectures on the different genealogies, but she says, forget who begat who. Let's look at the theological message that's in each genealogy. And her exhortation would be, never skip over genealogy. Always focus on what is the message. But keep in mind in Genesis 5 and 11, it's in Hebrew. The Hebrew word there for father, uh, ab, can also mean grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, etc. The Hebrew word for son, ben, can mean grand grandson, great-grandson, great-great-grandson, etc. And what's interesting when you get to the book of Daniel, Belteshazzar refers to Nebuchadnezzar as his father. There's four generations between them, and they're not blood-related. So it doesn't even imply a blood relationship uh, when you see those words. And so, and again, you can pick this up if you look at the translation of Genesis 5 and the 40 different English translations that are considered faithful. You get an idea of the flexibility of the Hebrew words in the original. And if you ever have any doubts about this, go get a good Hebrew uh, English lexicon and they'll tell you in quite a bit of detail uh, what the actual uh, original Hebrew nouns and verbs uh, really mean. Yes? Um, I feel like one of the problems you can sometimes run into with when you are going back to Hebrew and stuff is how important the context becomes. Yes. Because obviously, like you said, Hebrew is one of those languages where they, we might have one word for it in our culture today, but back then they might have had six words for individual accounts of different things. So that being said, I feel like sometimes through, specifically through the Genesis account of creation, that some of the translations are very important when it comes to the context of what is being spoken. Right. And then references later in scripture, like, um, for example, there's a good one in, uh, I believe it's Exodus 20, where it talks about where Moses is kind of uh, setting the stage for the six days of labor, and one day is the sa Sabbath, and kind of really what we still follow today. Um, and that being said, um, he, that's something that I feel like is coming straight out of Genesis that he's referring to, something that um, it gets into where you get into the morning and evening, where there's just several different places where it kind of gives a bit of, I believe, a time frame into what it is. And like you said, the word day in Hebrew is definitely one of those words that can be used in a lot of different ways. Right. I mean, Moses even uses it as like the day of Moses, or the day of Abraham, I think is the, the better example. Um, but that being said, I, I believe that's really where the context becomes very important. It is, and Exodus 20 is the go-to text of young earth creationists. People like Ken Ham, for example, say that's an irrefutable declaration uh, that uh, God is communicating to Moses uh, that the days of creation are only 24 hours each. Okay, I've written about this in my book, A Matter of Days, and I'm not the only one. Lots of Hebrew scholars have written on this. And what I see consistently coming from Ken Ham's writings is he'll quote one particular text but ignore all the parallel texts. So, for example, in the Levitical law, uh, that uh, statement about that it's the Sabbath, work six days, rest in the Sabbath, shows up five times in uh, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Exodus. So Exodus 20 isn't the only one. You need to look at the other four. Only two of them do they make a link uh, between the creation days in Genesis and our Sabbath. Uh, the other three do not. Moreover, the preposition that you see in almost every English translation, the preposition is missing in the original Hebrew. So for it says, for in six days, the word in is not in the original. That makes a difference how you read the text. And so several Bible scholars have said, well, notice, if you look at the entire Torah, there's more than one Sabbath period. So for example, when you go to Leviticus 23, 
it talks about the Sabbath for the agricultural land, how it's to be worked for six years and given a Sabbath rest of one year. So it's making the point, when you actually look at all of these in context, you see there are different Sabbath periods. People like Ken Ham claim whenever it talks about Sabbath, it's always 24 hours. Well, Leviticus 23 would counter that. And here's what's really going on. If we're talking about human beings, what makes us most efficient in our work is that we take a 24-hour period out of our seven-day work week uh, to rest. There have been experiments done in Russia and France. In France, they had a 10-day work week. They worked nine days, they rested on the 10th day. Soviet Russia had four days and a fifth day of rest. In both cases, they went back to the seven-day uh, work week. Why? Because they discovered productivity went down. Uh, it didn't work in Soviet Russia with a five-day work week. It didn't work in France in the revolution with a 10-day work week. We really are biologically designed to have a 24-hour rest period. The agricultural land is a different biological entity. And you say, well, why do we need to give the agricultural land a year of rest? Well, it's because of nematodes. Uh, nematodes will eat all your harvest. Uh, but if you give the land a year of rest where you don't plant anything, it starves the nematodes. Now, we could pass that today with insecticides. But in the context of Leviticus, that's pre-insecticides. You better give them, and that's why the Jews had greater agricultural productivity because they obeyed that Sabbath command. God is spirit. He has no biological limitations. And therefore, there's nothing that forbids him from taking a longer or a shorter uh, west period. And so, and the very fact is, the seventh day is God's rest period. And you got both Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4 telling us we're still in that seventh day. Which is why people like Gleason Archer said, you know, this is similar to what we see throughout the entire uh, Torah. There's all these holidays, holy days, that the Jews were commanded to celebrate. And in each case, it's an analogy. So, for example, you've got the Feast of Tabernacles, an eight-day period uh, where they would rest. And that was an analogy for the 38 years they wandered in the wilderness. So he said the eight days is not equivalent to 38 years, but it makes a theological point. Sure. Therefore, Gleason Archer said, Exodus 20, likewise, is an analogy. Uh, and the analogy is the principle is seven. You work six, you rest one. With the agricultural land, it was six and one. With God, it's six and one. The periods do not all have to be identical. So, quick follow-up question in regards to yeah. that. Um, so, I'm, a, I'm very much a big picture kind of guy. So, it's one of those things where I like to boil it down to kind of some of the, the rules of logic and the whole way back to kind of the beginning wow. fundamental points. And that being said, um, it's kind of understanding, I think, what Scripture was written for. Mm -hmm. I believe Scripture was written for believers. Scripture was written yes. for... Um, us to have a complete manual for us to how we should live our lives and all the information we need to be able to dispute things that are potentially wrong. Um, that being said, um, obviously with a time period like that, I totally agree that agriculture wise it might benefit from a much longer period or something like that, but I think in reference to Exodus and the Genesis creation account, God isn't writing that to agriculture, he's writing that to believers. He's writing that for believers to see and well, not just believers, but unbelievers also benefit from obeying the Sabbath. So it's written for all humanity. And right now I'm working on a book where I'm debating theologians who are trying to make the case that the Bible is only inspired for the generation of the author. And basically I'm countering that by saying, no, it's inspired for all generations. And so Genesis needs to be something that can be comprehended by the generation of Moses, but it's also meant to be comprehended by all generations. And what you see in 1 Peter 1 uh, is the doctrine of progressive revelation, that even the inspired authors of the Bible frequently knew that what the Holy Spirit was inspiring them to write was for a more complete understanding by a future generation, and how they longed to understand what the Holy Spirit was inspiring them to write, but realized, I can get some of this, but not all of it. 
which means that theologians never have to worry about being unemployed. There's always more to learn from the text of Scripture. And I actually saw that in going through the world's holy books. Probably one of the best examples of that is the Quran. Extremely repetitious, very vague, and the content level is really low. One reading is really all you need. You're going to get everything in one reading because of how little content is in there. You can't do that with the Bible. One reason I concluded the Bible had to be the inspired and errant word of God, no matter how many times you read it, there's always more to learn. Every time I read through the Bible, I discover things I didn't read or understand in the previous 30 times I read the Bible. So I tell my theologian friends, don't worry about losing your jobs. Uh, and of course, in science, there's always more to learn too. I don't have to worry that, hey, we're going to, have to lay off all the astronomers because we know everything about the universe, which means we're always going to have fun things to debate. Okay. Yes, uh, one of the first things I did when I joined the pastoral staff of the church where I presently serve, they asked me to teach on the book of Revelation. I said, well, to do it justice, we need to appreciate that the book of Revelation is a capstone for all the Old Testament prophetic books, which adds up to about one-third of the entire Bible. So I said, I'm not going to be able to get through this in one month. They said, well, take as much time as you need. So we went through all the Old Testament prophetic books, as well as the book of Revelation, as well as several New Testament books that also deal with eschatology. Say, so how long did it take you to get through all that? Well, we met every Sunday, and we would meet for about an hour and a half, because uh, we would be debating issues too, so, and we had debates afterwards. Uh, it took seven years, nine months to get through uh, the book of Revelation, and our church to this day affectionately calls that the Great Tribulation. <laughs> By the way, it all got recorded. If you go to paradoxes.org, it's archived there. Yes. Yes, one more. Okay. Hold it and repeat that. I didn't get it. Do you think the earth started decaying after the fall of humanity, or do you think the earth had decayed before? Okay. The universe has been decaying from the very moment that God created it. The law of decay is pervasive. We see that in uh, Romans chapter 8. The entire universe is subjected. Some translations say the law of corruption, the law of decay. Uh, but it's referring to the second law of thermodynamics. And what you see in Genesis 3.17, it says, cursed is the ground because of you. Not because God changed any of the physics. The physics didn't change. It was Adam who changed. And so now you've got sinners working the agricultural land. And because of her sin, the land doesn't produce as God had created the land to produce. So no change in the laws of physics. There will be no change until the full number of humans that God intends to redeem have in fact been redeemed. So you're saying that the ground was cursed uh, was a consequence of our sin? The ground was cursed because now you've got sinful human beings working it. And we, we see that to this day. I mean, all over the world, we're irrigating agricultural lands and not taking into account that we're making the soil saltier and saltier as we do that. And so there is a way to irrigate so you don't make the land saltier. But the vast majority of agricultural lands in the world, uh, the soils are getting progressively saltier, which means they're getting progressively less productive. So the sin factor is still a problem. Okay, that was the last question. Thank you. Uh, I'll be here tomorrow night and the next night too. Uh, we'll talk. Yeah, right.